Hey, and welcome to Internet Roundup. I'm Chuck. That's Josh. Yes. In the deep, darkest corner over there is Casey. The bowels. Isn't that creepy? Oh, yeah. It's That's like where Casey likes it. Covered in black duvetine. What? New word for me. Duvetine? Yeah. That's a film industry term. You should know it. You were on TV. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't paying attention. <laughs> you know, like the heavy black uh, fabric that they'll put up to like black out a window or something? Felt. Duvetine. Uh, crushed velvet. <laughs> that's what we had on set. Yeah. Maybe antique that's why we velvet. got canceled. We spent a lot we of the budget the on the antique crushed velvet. All right. Once a week, we uh, round up the internet two stories at a time. And this week, I guess we should start with uh, this neat thing you found on seaweed. Yeah, man. There's Could this be the answer. A really great um, blog that one of the great things about it is it is frequently updated. It's called Next Nature. <laughs> is that one of the net. good things? It is, it's really. It's actually still being updated. There are some great blogs out there that are like, oh, sorry, I haven't like updated in two months, but uh, yeah. I didn't feel like it. Like so, our own. Uh, okay, all right. <laughs> Let's take it easy there. We're busy doing other stuff. True. So one of the things we were talking about, Chuck, with sea level rise, mm-hmm. with um, the- uh, Rising temperatures across the world? Yeah. Yeah. AKA global warming, that's what I was trying to think of. (laughs) Or climate change, depending on your political persuasion. Um, One of the things that gets overlooked with that is ocean acidification. That's right, big deal. It is a big deal because it's going to completely change the ecosystem of the oceans, not just... um, it's not just going to make it more difficult for fish to survive and thrive. Mm-hmm. Coral reefs have yeah. trouble with that. And they're actually an indicator species, the canary in the coal mine, if you will. Yeah. How, or how about anything with a shell? How about a crab that can't form a shell? Exactly. Or a lobster that can't form a shell? You like eating good that luck, stuff? Good luck being a crab under those conditions, right? Yeah. You like lobster bisque? Then maybe you might want to think about planting some seaweed. R- right. That's that's a solution to this is planting a bunch of kelp. Yep. Because um, when the oceans acidify, everybody's in trouble. But it turns out that by planting kelp, and not even, uh, well, I mean, I think it's a substantial part unless you're talking percentages. Yeah. But not even that much kelp, you can actually reverse the course of the ocean acidification, which increases as CO2 levels increase, right? Mm-hmm. So take it away, Chuck. Uh, well, it's already a big thing in Asia, apparently, but not to help the environment, although that's a byproduct. Right. But it's, you know, like any kind of farming, they eat seaweed a lot more over there than we do, even though it's delicious. Yeah. And um, they do it in Asia as, you know, as a food source. It's but, like a, a seaweed farm. Sure. Yeah. But you could do that all over the world if you wanted to and utilize it as a resource of food and uh, to help lower the acidification of the ocean. Yeah, they figured out that by covering 9% of the ocean surface yeah. with seaweed farms, planting seaweed farms to to that amount, which it sounds like, oh, well, 9%, you know, it's not that big. That's a lot of seaweed. Yeah, plus there's not that, there's I don't know how much there is, but there's not a lot of um, ocean compared to the ocean overall where you could plant seaweed and have this effect necessarily because oh, seaweed really? still needs light for photosynthesis. Yeah. A lot of the ocean is super, super deep, right? Um, but if you could cover ni- uh, an amount equal to 9% of the ocean surface with seaweed, mm-hmm. um, it could have all sorts of amazing effects. Specifically, Chuck, you could create biofuel from it that could completely replace um, fossil fuel entirely for, for energy production. Amazing. And it would remove 53 gigatons of carbon dioxide per year. It's amazing. Ocean acidification, not any longer. So- you think 9%, that's that's a pretty lofty goal. But even if it's just a couple of percentage points, um, if we ramp it up some to that much, you'll be doing a lot of good. Sure. You know? Yep. So up with kelp. Yeah, go plant some kelp today. What else are you going to do? Nothing. <laughs> when this plane lands, go plant some kelp. Uh, and moving on to the Cleveland Clinic, one of the best hospitals in our great country. Do a lot of great work there. Mm-hmm. They are... Um, performing the first uterus transplant in the United States. Yes. Amazing. And it's not necessarily the first one in the world. No. And by not necessarily, I should say, it isn't. That's right. (laughs) But it is in the United States. And if anybody's going to try it out in the United States, it's very appropriate to the Cleveland Clinic because they're on the bleeding edge of medical technology. (laughs) 
Not true, but they are uh, helping this one woman out. Um, she found out when she was 16 that she would never be able to carry her own child because she was affected with something called uh, Meyer uh, Rokotansky Custer Hauser, M-R-K-H, which means she was born without uh, certain parts of her uterus, cervix, and vagina. Um, pretty rare, affects just one in 5,000 women. Which, to me, that doesn't seem that rare. This seems like yeah. it would be really, really rare. Like one in a million kind of thing, but no. Yeah, one in 5,000. Yeah. Not rare enough. And um, that means that you can't have your own children, and um, it's a big struggle for a lot of women, and it's bad news to get when you're 16, of course. Yeah. And so uh, they found out through their friends in Sweden it was possible. Yeah. And here's the neat thing. It's not permanent. They put the uterus in. The lady has her baby. Um, maybe two. Maybe two, although they, the you jury's out on that, if they can really do that safely. Well, they seem to not want to go, definitely not go beyond two. Past two. Right. But then they take the uterus back out. Yeah, it's called an ephemeral transplant. Amazing. Sure, it's amazing. First of all, a uteral transplant is amazing. Yeah, from a cadaver. But a temper, yeah, a temporary. Who's not using it anymore? Sure. A temporary u- uh, uterus transplant is even more amazing. It's just basically showing off. It's it's Western medicine being like, look what we can do. Yeah, and the chances are pretty good. Um, in Sweden, at the University of Gothenburg, uh, they have had performed nine uterus transplants, resulting in five pregnancies and four live births. So. Yep. A little less than 50%, but if your chances are zero, then that's uh, that's hope. Sure, it know? is. Um, and the Cleveland Clinic has 10 women lined up for basically a proof of concept study Yeah, where they're they're saying, let's give this a shot. Yeah. So good luck, uh, ladies, and yeah. good luck, doctors. And Best of luck. Great work you're doing, and we're, we're going to follow up on this in about a year. Okay. See how that went. Maybe nine months. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, you got anything else? The paper is folded. <laughs> and Chuck, we should say Happy New Year to everybody. Happy New Year. And happy birthday, Yumi. Happy birthday, Yumi, my my work husband's wife. <laughs> That's right. I don't know what that makes her. It makes her great. So happy birthday, Yumi. Happy birthday.